Welcome to the New America Foundation. Um, I'm Peter Bergen, head of the National Security Studies Program. It's really a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ali, Dr. Salim Ali, who's a distinguished uh, geographer, environmentalist. Uh, he's written a paper uh, about ecological cooperation in South Asia, which we're publishing today. Obviously, India and Pakistan have shared interests as well as shared disputes. Um, and the burden of Dr. Ali's paper is to suggest ways that India and Pakistan could address some of these issues through some of the existing international bodies that exist, like SARC. Uh, Dr. Ali is uh, presently on uh, sort of an extended sabbatical, I guess, in, at the University of Queensland in Australia. He's a um, professor at the University of Vermont. Uh, he's written uh, on extensively on many issues, mining, ecology, environmentalism, even madrasas in Pakistan. So he's going to uh, give us a, a presentation of the findings of his paper, and then we'll open it up to a discussion with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for the introduction and also for uh, inviting me to write this paper, it's uh, quite a bold effort on the part of the New America Foundation to consider environmental uh, security issues. Uh, they have uh, tended to be marginalized often among uh, Washington think tanks, or they tend to be siloed in particular areas, but the connection between their importance um, for national security uh, is uh, often um, quite uh, minimal. So I'm really appreciative of that opportunity, and it really shows that the New America Foundation uh, is um, at that cutting edge. Uh, I want to uh, also note that my affiliation in Australia is uh, long term uh, for the time being. I have uh, taken a professional leave from the University of Vermont, um, and so I retain my tenure there, which is a luxury tenure academics can have, but I, I feel very much part of my Australian affiliation just as much as my Vermont one, and hence all these <laughs> multiple websites for you to um, consider. Uh, in terms of uh, my Vermont affiliation, there's the Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security, which I started there a few years ago. That's the website for that. Uh, and this project initially, when Peter contacted me, was part of that um, uh, initiative that we had started on environmental diplomacy. And my email is there. I'm providing that since uh, I'd, I'd, I've run out of business cards during this last two weeks I've been in the US. So if you need to reach me, uh, that's my long-term email. No matter where I am, it's my lifelong email, uh, my alumni address. So you can always find me through that um, email address. Now, um, in terms of this topic, um, if we think about this notion of low versus high politics, I'm very uh, conscious of not being very you know, particular about causality when we talk about environmental issues and the importance for cooperation leading to security. Because there's a tendency oftentimes when you talk about environmental issues, people will come to you and say, well, you know, th there are much more significant and more dangerous and imminent threats which confront us. Uh, especially if you think about the situation in the last week in Pakistan in uh, terms of the terrorist attacks in Balochistan, uh, you'd think about the line of control um, incidents between India and Pakistan. And immediately when you talk about the environment, there's a certain sort of glaze which comes over. Mm -hmm. So I'm very conscious of noting <clears throat> that I, in my work, I have always tried to look at the full panoply of causes. And uh, I, even though my own training is in environmental planning, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that there are many other causes for conflict uh, and many other rationales for cooperation. Um, however, the connection between the environment being a low politics issue and security being a high politics issue can be made much more deliberately, which I've tried to do. So for example, some of my earlier work on madrasas, on Islam and education, which is referenced there, a book which was published a few years ago, um, I, I looked at you know, those kind of more sort of hard politics issues of security, uh, but again, try to see, are there any connections which can be made with 
uh, natural resources as well. So some points to consider. Territorial disputes have ecological underpinnings. If you think about uh, the Kashmir dispute, uh, it clearly is about an eco-region. It's about a, a mountainous region. It has a lot to do with water resources and so on. That's not the only factor, hence partially is capitalized, but it is a contributing factor. And while it's very compelling to uh, present a more dominant causality in terms of op-eds and so on, um, I tend to approach these matters in a much more uh, dialectical way, you know, trying to say, well, this could lead to that, but then there could be a feedback mechanism whereby one process becomes more dominant and so on. So please bear with me as I try to make those connections. So for example, if you think about environmental issues, and you think about even the, the issues of sectarian conflict in Pakistan, the land rights and the division of lands as to who controls it, that leads to certain perceptions of inequality, which perpetuates rifts, ethnic rifts, and so on as well. Uh, how that happens with migration flows, uh, with agricultural access, uh, with regard to the land availability itself, those are definitely factors which we cannot neglect for providing that fertile ground for conspiratorial rhetoric and all of those very um, dominant forms of extremism to, to take root. So that's the kind of sort of more panoramic view which I try to present in my research. And um, I want to be very clear about that at the outset, that what I'm going to say um, uh, for the rest of the presentation does not preclude these. Okay. Having said that, I also want to uh, share with you that my experience in South Asia, it's important to uh, have a full disclosure that I am originally from Pakistan. Uh, I am a Pakistani American. I was born in the US, but uh, grew up uh, partly in Pakistan. All my higher education was uh, in the US. Um, uh, and now I live in Australia. So I do see myself as someone who has some roots in the region, but can sort of zoom out and also look at these issues from uh, a more macro perspective. It's important to share that with you because any kind of writing around South Asia is always perceived with that lens. And um, at the same time, we, though my you know, background is more from the Pakistani side, I have had extensive field experience across South Asia. In India, uh, all, all across parts of India, as well as in Bangladesh and Nepal and Sri Lanka. Um, and so I, I do try my best to look at these issues regionally, despite my dominance clearly being in terms of my background from Pakistan. I've also been involved in various track two processes, which have looked at ways to resolve different kinds of disputes between India and Pakistan. Um, those of you, are, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, the term track two, but it's basically you know, informal processes, not at the governmental level, but which can feed into governmental level policies. Uh, content uh, analysis of public statements is something which I did for this report. I was very conscious of not just trying to provide my own opinions in a vacuum, because it's um, often easy to do that, but can be challenged also within the policy domain. So I tried to find as much as I could statements by public officials, by leaders in South Asia, uh, to give more context and weight to the analysis. So uh, thanks to some of the research assistance provided by New America Foundation, we actually looked at speeches, public statements of key South Asian leaders, conference proceedings from international governmental conferences and so on as part of the methodology. I also looked at international environmental treaties to which these countries are already signatories. Uh, because that also provides some more weight in terms of saying, look, you have actually agreed to certain international legal obligations. And therefore, what I'm saying is not just my opinion and policy recommendations, but it's something you have agreed to. So that was also part of the analysis. And then where needed, interviews were conducted with individual analysts and decision makers where I couldn't get information from these other sources. So the structure of the report, <clears throat> these are sort of the, the key sections. And what I'll try to do in the presentation is highlight some parts of it. I won't try to do the full sort of um, uh, summary of the whole report. Uh, the draft is available outside. Uh, it's literally hot off the press, so it's not even on the website yet, and will probably be on the website later in the week. But these are the sections. I start off, first of all, by looking at 
existing regional organizations as the starting point for any means by which we can have cooperation. So my starting point there is also <clears throat> that even though historically there may not have been as much progress with certain organizations, uh, we should not therefore assume that those organizations cannot be reformed or changed to provide more cooperative context. So we'll talk specifically about SARC, for example, which has been time and again, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation has been criticized for not being as proactive. Uh, but I'll try to present to you but that it, there is still space for SARC to be reformed. Um, so we we'll go, go into those uh, discussions around existing agreements and organizations. The second uh, section in the report focuses on the Himalayas. Uh, and there is a... The, the, I start off with the question around just by reviewing the cooperative agreements that exist, mountains have had particular interest from countries in cooperation. And so I say, well, why is it that mountains have been a focus of environmental cooperation? I try to address that question in terms of the, the salience of the Himalayas. Why, why are the Himalayas are particularly important, both from an environmental perspective in terms of being the source of water for much of the region, um, but being also the most capricious source of water, um, but also because they define boundaries in many cases. Uh, mountain ranges define boundaries uh, at the micro level even. If you look at some of the conflicts around uh, Siachen, for example, the Sal Toro Ridge, you, you often hear about the mountain being the definitive uh, boundary. Okay? So the, there's a discussion around the importance of the Himalayas and particularly one organization is analyzed there, which is the uh, International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, ISIMOD. Uh, and how it came about, why um, it has had success, but limited success because its mandate has been limited. Uh, and then some uh, recommendations which will follow from that. Uh, I also look at scales of analysis then in the third section where we can draw some lessons from national, regional and international approaches. So, uh, for example, uh, there are many contested organizations in that whole region. You have uh, to the north, you have uh, China and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You have um, uh, organizations such as uh, agreements and organizations which have come about through India's uh, uh, attachment to the Far East. Uh, you have uh, uh, several of these smaller conferences and organizations uh, which we can draw lessons from. And then also at the local level, there have been some um, arrangements made particularly on cooperation. The fourth section focuses on the role of engineering and technocratic approaches to fostering cooperation. And here particularly what's important to consider is the Indus Waters Treaty. The Indus Waters Treaty was negotiated partly with the help of the World Bank and has a, a focus on technical aspects of cooperation. It's important to note that it is a distributive cooperation agreement and not an integrative one. Essentially, the agreement divided up the rivers between India and Pakistan. So it, it was never meant to be a regional cooperation agreement. And hence, uh, some of the recommendations which follow around that. And on that particular issue, there has been previous work done. The Stimson Center is continuing to do some very interesting work in that arena. But I've tried to bring it within this more regional context as well, looking at the Himalayas, looking at the whole water distribution uh, management system. Food security, clearly a serious problem uh, across the region. Uh, it's, despite all of the progress that has been made in South Asia with development, particularly uh, in India, uh, it is still worth remembering uh, that you still have more people living in abject poverty in South Asia than all of Sub-Saharan Africa combined. So you cannot ignore the desperate destitution which still pervades South Asia. Uh, and given the population growth rates, and especially some parts of South Asia, it is particularly alarming what will happen in the next 20 to 30 years. So food security is going to be exceedingly important. Here I try to make a linkage with some of the other very admirable work that the New America Foundation is trying to do um, around trade and providing a, a much more coherent regional trade policy. And there are environmental dimensions to trade which could be made uh, in a more um, specific way. 
which I tried to argue for here, specifically around food security and how you choose what kinds of items should be prioritized for trade. You can prioritize items for trade based on, for example, the embedded water that is used to produce those items, because that's going to define how much water is going to be available for, for other resources, keeping in mind that 70% of water is still used for agriculture, largely for food production. Right? So then prioritizing trade around those rather than choosing trade just based on some other happenstance uh, criteria. Then there's a section which tries to bring in some lots of ancillary issues. Um, and I try to have a sort of a convergence of these issues uh, around um, what I call derivative convergence. And there, please pardon, I, I still have that bit of an academic uh, cadence in my communication, but uh, I've tried to you know, make it a little bit more user friendly, but um, this comes up every now and then. But basically what I'm trying to say there is that there are, uh, when you, whenever you're dealing with public policy, you have lots of these kind of peripheral issues which come up. Someone will say, well, you know, there was a dengue fever epidemic in Pakistan. Why shouldn't India and Pakistan cooperate on dengue fever issues? Because India has not had that much dengue fever uh, prevalence as much as Pakistan. So let's bring that in. Uh, oh, and by the way, maritime cooperation, there's a dispute going on in Sir Creek in the Indus Delta, um, which has a lot to do with very interesting aspects of, um, uh, you know, regional uh, mapping and how you consider the boundary of a creek, which is constantly changing in itself because it's a delta uh, region. Uh, and so how do you provide frames of analysis which can provide some convergence around these what may seem unrelated issues? So there's a section which deals with that. There's a very small section which tries to then say that all of these different things which are going on, let us not forget that there's a strong track to diplomatic effort, which to a large degree the US government has supported. You know, despite the US government's relative non-involvement in terms of Indo-Pak peace building, the US government has been very reluctant to mediate in any way between India and Pakistan directly, partly because both sides have been resistant to any external mediation. But there have been lots of efforts at track two diplomacy, which have been pushed forward by the US government, especially, for example, the, the NISA Center at the National Defense University, which has done a series of these, funded several different workshops. They've even funded Canadian universities to do these track two processes because they think the Canadians may actually have a little bit more uh, of a palatable um, sort of uh, packaging of uh, track two. Uh, so you have th these fascinating processes which kind of often go below the radar and are not made um, you know, a, a greater sort of a track one effort. And those lessons from track two are not translated to the track one level. So I, I briefly make that connection. Uh, particularly, there's one track two uh, process which the Atlantic Council has been doing uh, and focused on the Siachen Glacier dispute, which some of you may be familiar with my earlier writings. I have written quite a bit on Siachen and partly also in an advocacy capacity have tried to work on environmental peace building efforts in Siachen. So uh, then finally, I have sort of a conclusions and recommendations section which ties this all together. Okay. Now, we did commission a specific map for this report, and I'm, I'm really appreciative for the map makers' patience on putting this together. This map, I think, will have a, 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 you know, much use beyond this report because we, we put in things on this map which are not found in most places. Uh, together. So, for example, on this map, we've got um, proposed uh, dam projects, which have been a source of conflict, uh, different hydroelectric projects, uh, which are often not even talked about in the mainstream media. Uh, but, you know, you've got uh, the Nimbu project, you've got several of these dams, which are already existing and have caused uh, concern. Um, we've, we've put also um, some of the other regional cooperation efforts, like the roots of the pipelines that are proposed, the IPI pipeline, uh, the uh, TAPI pipeline. Uh, and uh, then you've got this other bit, which is often absent from any map, really, except if you go to the AC mode website, uh, which is the uh, transboundary conservation corridors, which have been proposed by ISI mode. The, uh, the, the mountain development center I mentioned, which is headquartered in Kathmandu. There are seven transboundary conservation 
corridors which are mentioned. But what I found interesting was that, and this shows you how environment still remains low politics. None of these seven involve both India and Pakistan, the most acrimonious players in this group. Now, ecologically, that doesn't make sense because clearly Pakistan and India do share eco-regions which are of salience. Um, so, for example, this one here, which is the central Karakoram National Park in Pakistan, uh, with the, the uh, Chinese conservation area on the other side, clearly could include the Indian side too. But to avoid political conflagration, India was not part of that equation. Now, um, one would say that that's an area where there should be greater international engagement to say, well, if you really want to think ecologically, that's something which you should do. So you've got seven of these corridors. The two which are particularly interesting, I think, for our purposes in terms of regional cooperation in the most difficult areas, the Karakorams and the Wahan Corridor. The Wahan Corridor uh, also in includes Tajikistan and, uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, and the, the, uh, uh, the interesting history to that is that USAID, about five years ago, was willing to support a transboundary conservation effort in that region. George Schaller, the eminent conservationist, Pulitzer Prize winning author, was very much involved in that because that involves the Pamir region partly, the Marco Polo sheep, some of the, con the areas of high conservation value, the snow leopards, uh, and Schaller, of course, has worked on snow leopard conservation. So, but unfortunately, it has lost momentum and there was not really much done um, after that initial effort from Schaller uh, and USAID about five, six years ago, um, I've heard that it may well be resurrected soon, but that's one where you know, clearly there should be some uh, US government prioritization around that uh, region because it could provide some very important opportunities for fostering greater regional cooperation. So the effort with ISI mode, largely with these conservation areas, has been in this region, Everest, You've got the Kanchanchunga corridor, and that's where the donors have given most of their money. Because the European donors who have largely funded ISI mode, they don't want to get involved too much with those contentious areas, even though there is much more potential for regional cooperation. So, I mean, part of the recommendations are, well, you should incentivize greater cooperation in areas where there is likely to be a greater peace dividend, rather than doing so much on Everest when there has been so much done already on Everest and the conservation areas. Kanchanchunga, world's third highest mountain, clearly very important in this region, but a lot has been done on it already. Okay? And then you have also this one interesting one here with uh, Myanmar or Burma, which uh, has some potential interest if we look more uh, you know, regionally, uh, and uh, also with the Brahmaputra and the new dams which are going to be built by the Chinese there, some very interesting work which could be done around that. So then the other thing in this map which we also put forward is the uh, road and uh, tr uh, rail bound uh, crossings. And you can see that's important because we want to make the linkage with trade. And even though these crossings are there, Few of them are active. So you've got clearly the Vaga crossing here, which is active, and then you have one on the Kashmir side, which is somewhat active. But there is much potential for um, these other crossings also being used um, for trade, and especially incentivizing trade around renewable energy issues, um, around what I was saying with food security, choosing those, prioritizing those products which have more embedded water, in areas where water is more available. And that those trade routes can be uh, definitely done at low cost because that infrastructure does exist. Now, just um, to give you some flavor of the, you know, the kinds of arguments I talk about, SARC, the critique of SARC has been that it's been an ineffective organization um, because it's really limited by its mandate. So these are sort of the five key areas, uh, the mandate of SARC. And I agree that this has been an issue, but this is something which can be revisited. There is no reason why it can't be revisited. And there has been some hint that there could be some revisiting of SARC around particularly areas of energy cooperation, which may have even um, you know, potentially sensitive aspects of, for example, water connected to them. 
even though water, for example, the Indus Waters Treaty has been handled bilaterally and with World Bank mediation occasionally, SARC has not been involved with that. But as SARC gets more involved in energy issues, uh, it will be inevitable that there's going to be some connection there. Okay. So SARC has been limited by these, but that should not mean that the future of SARC is going to be constrained as well. So that's part of the, uh, the, the argument that I try to make. So one example which I use then in terms of international environmental law, uh, you have in the UN Economic Commission for Europe, which interestingly enough extends the definition of Europe uh, according to this commission, extends all the way to Tajikistan. <laughs> so that means actually our Wakhan corridor could be a tran it could be bordering a European uh, commission area, a UN Economic Commission at least for Europe area. Uh, that um, uh, commission has this panoply of conventions around environmental cooperation, which we could consider as an interesting model for South Asia as well. So on, on the, uh, uh, the Asian side, you have ESCAP, the uh, United Nations Economic uh, Commission for um, Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, there could be some greater effort made on the part of the international donor community to consider some similar regional conventions and to empower SARC to be able to operationalize such conventions also. Now, SARC has a proposed uh, environmental convention which may come into force when the next meeting happens, because the, the problem with SARC has this last meeting got postponed because Nepal was not able to host it. It's going to be now uh, some months further. But there has been some um, momentum along those lines of moving forward with that environmental treaty. Uh, this whole model can provide some guidance. And so we've got um, some analysis around this in the report. The other aspect, uh, and uh, thanks to Jennifer Rowland for putting together this uh, table quickly for the report, it um, uh, lays out some of the key um, conventions that I think have much promise for fostering this more regional cooperative approach. Because if you see you know, which countries have actually ratified these conventions, you, the ones which we would want, India and Pakistan particularly, uh, have ratified um, most of them, right? So it's part of already the legislature has, has given approval for the mandate of these conventions. And if you go into the text of uh, a lot of these international agreements, transboundary conservation is within the program of work. I, I've been to many of the con you know, conferences of the parties of these conventions, and each time there is a transboundary aspect which is mentioned. But the, the challenge is then that you need leadership and I think incentives from the international donor community to actually move forward with those. So especially like, for example, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. If you think about the Sir Creek dispute, uh, and I wrote a short article around this notion of wetland diplomacy because Ramsar is one of the very successful international environmental agreements. On the Pakistani side, there is already a Ramsar protected wetland site adjoining that Sir Creek area. On the Indian side in Gujarat, there is tremendous potential for actually generating a similar transboundary wetland site, uh, which could provide for a transboundary conservation area that could help to resolve the Sir Creek dispute, similar to the way the Cordillera del Condor dispute was resolved between Ecuador and Peru through a transboundary conservation area. Um, and that was just as much an acrimonious conflict going you know, back several decades, armed conflict between both sides. Um, but with the help of international intervention, Brazil and the United States, NASA providing uh, assurance in terms of uh, potential violations of borders and so on and remote sensing imagery and all that, um, you, we were able to actually resolve that dispute through a conservation area being established. So similar idea for Ramsar, lots of these agreements have potential for regional cooperation uh, as well. The Convention on Biological Diversity, one of the conventions coming out of the Rio summit, tremendous potential. There's a whole program of work around transboundary conservation as well. And then actually one other quick mention is the Doha agreement, the TRIPS agreement. This deals with trade. So trade-related aspects of intellectual property, um, there could be 
a, a cooperation around that as well, which uh, goes to the health diplomacy bit that I was mentioning. The other thing we talk about in this um, report is the existing networks which exist, which are already there. Many times, you know, we 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 look at them in isolation. And one of the key um, findings of this report is that there needs to be much better coordination between these existing networks. So, for example, the World Bank. Uh, and um, the uh, Swedish Development Agency and a few other European donors have been supporting this network called Sandy. How many of you have heard of Sandy? Okay, one person has, good. So it's South Asian Network for Development and Environmental Economics, which has been going on for a decade. And it's actually been pretty successful in getting South Asian scholars who work on environment together to do research, but they have not prioritized joint research. I interviewed the director for this project, and she said, you know what, we, we room Indians and Pakistanis together when they visit Kathmandu, but we haven't really encouraged joint research projects. So, well, it's good that they actually encourage interaction through that kind of, you know, more programmatic effort, but to actually have joint research, which is incentivized around that, that's a great network. It could be further developed. It has many high-profile people like Sir pa Partha Das Gupta, the, the, you know, the famed Cambridge economist is on the board of Sandy. Uh, you have a tremendous amount of um, donor support going into it, um, but it, it needs to be reconfigured and given that specific incentive and impetus to, to focus on regional cooperation. You have USAID SARI program, which is an excellent effort. It's one of the few donor efforts which is really targeted at regional cooperation. Um, it's on energy issues connecting that with some of these more intractable issues around conflict as well. Not, not necessarily making it into a huge sort of a diplomatic effort, but just prioritizing and making sure that you can connect those issues in a more deliberate way. Uh, this effort, the South Asian Cooperative Environment Program, set up several years ago uh, by a UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. Again, not really given that same impetus to move forward. The most recent one, the Climate uh, and Development Knowledge Network, which has uh, DFID uh, support, or UK aid as it's called now, the British government's effort, very well-funded effort, and the regional coordination is being done um, by LEAD Pakistan, Leadership in Environment and Development, which is an NGO originally. It was started by the Rockefeller Foundation, but now um, the LEAD network is fairly independent, and the, the Pakistan LEAD office is coordinating this for the whole region. Tremendous potential, again, to prioritize regional cooperation within this kind of an effort. But again, it is still not on the radar. I interviewed the director there, and he also admitted the same, that that has not been the incentive from the donors, even though it could very well be. And then you have this APN network, which is interesting because this uh, Asia-Pacific network extends all the way to my current home in Australia. Australia and New Zealand are part of this network as well. And AusAid and some of the Australian aid agencies have tremendous potential to move forward with that. And when I, I'm back in Australia in a couple of weeks, one of my uh, you know, targets is to go to uh, Canberra and advocate for that, that there should be more AusAid support for these kinds of efforts targeted at regional cooperation as well. Crisis communication has been an important part of this, uh, the findings of this report. Clearly, with the, you know, as was advertised on this, um, uh, about this event, more people have been killed as a result of natural disasters, uh, you know, by several fold uh, compared to by terrorism. Uh, now, not all of that is preventable, but some of it is very much preventable in terms of regional cooperation. So if it's just the value of life itself, if you want to prioritize on that basis, there's tremendous incentive to do it on that uh, basis as well. So crisis communication, we've, this is a diagram which is in the report. It comes from a recent World Meteorological Organization, ISIMOD effort, which came about after these recent floods on how regionally we can have a system which uh, fosters cooperation. So this has been moving forward, and we've got um, considerable. This is one area where there is considerable momentum. Uh, and so crisis communication efforts, nas uh, national uh, hazard warning systems, coordinating among themselves uh, has much potential for further effort. And then finally, as I said, track to connectivity has been a major finding of this um, 
report with uh, that we need to make these connections. So let me just quickly go through a few of these with Syachin. Uh, we've in included um, some reference, and we may have a website which has more material on this, uh, but feel free to get in touch with me if you need more material on Siachen and some of the efforts along that. Uh, Sandia National Labs has twice had retired uh, US, uh, retired US military officials, but also Indian and Pakistani retired military officials working together uh, on cooperative monitoring plans for trying to resolve uh, the Siachen dispute. And you've had very senior level, level people, like the Air Marshal of the Indian Air Force, uh, retired Air Marshal uh, Nanda Karyapa. Um, I had uh, the, uh, the good fortune of being able to interview him also, um, not for this report, for, but for some of my earlier writings. And the, 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 the military strategists will tell you clearly that there is tremendous potential for environmental peace building in this region. Okay, so Siachen, track two diplomacy, you have most recently this Atlantic Council report, which I mentioned, the track two effort, where they just had a meeting in Lahore in September, and they've come forward with a particular set of recommendations on Siachen, on how to move forward with conflict resolution. And the environmental aspects are very much salient in there. And we were hoping that after this terrible tragedy of the avalanche in Siachen, uh, in um, March of last year, that there would have been some momentum, but unfortunately that momentum never came to, uh, to be. And uh, that's despite the fact um, that uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in 2006 had himself said that when he visited Siachen, he said, someday I hope this will be a peace mountain. You know, so he, the peace park narrative had reached him there. Uh, but it's not just you know, the feel-good version of peace. It's pragmatic peace. It's trying to figure out a very carefully, milit militarily, strategically argued vision of peace, which is possible and has been argued through these track two efforts. Sir Creek, same way, we've had retired Indian admirals, retired Pakistani admirals who have worked together on these efforts around Sir Creek. How do you come up with a mechanism whereby you can resolve the Sir Creek dispute, which is a, you know, a, a very small, you know, minor dispute in many ways. It has, and it's also decoupled from the Kashmir conflict, which has much more sort of emotional overtones. Um, Sir Creek is a relatively uninhabited area. I mean, it's a, usually this is the area where you have all these fishermen who get arrested every year, and then there's on the you know, Independence Days, there's uh, an exchange of uh, goodwill, and the fishermen get released by both sides. Um, that whole dynamic around fisheries, tremendous opportunity to make that connection between track two diplomacy for trade purposes too. You know, fisheries can be an important trade issue if you can figure out the right mechanism for cooperative management of these resources. Um, and there are amazing examples of cooperative maritime management. You have for mineral resources, which is what I do now much more so in Australia, my work is much more in the mining mineral sector. Amazing examples of cooperation on maritime mineral resources. Qatar and Iran cooperate on one of the world's largest gas fields in the Persian Gulf. There's a, a, a very you know, sort of convenient arrangement around that. So there are ways possible if you can have the leadership and the wherewithal to move forward, whether it is around uh, maritime minerals, maritime fishing, uh, a, a wide array of these issues. The Indus, uh, Clearly, much potential here. The Stimson Center's track two efforts on the Indus deserve uh, to be you know, c congratulated, and I hope that uh, there will be further movement on that. There, there are lots of other uh, initiatives within India and Pakistan um, that, are, that are trying to, at a more local level, uh, exchange best practices. Uh, but um, again, it, it is not often raised from track two to track one, which is unfortunate, and many times, you, you lose the opportunity if it's not done. And there is also less resilience in, this, the, in the process if it isn't done. Trade environment linkages, I've already mentioned. Uh, but one specific uh, example for track two that I would note here uh, is that um, this is where the private sector can get involved. So we have had visits from several Pakistani business people to India and vice versa. Uh, and the, the business connection on trade 
needs to be made much more so. I was in Davos last year at the World Economic Forum, and we had a special session around, uh, which was done informally among uh, Pakistani and Indian business people who were there. And uh, there was a lot of interest in moving forward, perhaps through the auspices of the World Economic Forum, which is actually having its uh, you know, next meeting, uh, the annual meeting is happening uh, next week, there could be tremendous opportunities for um, these efforts through the business community as well, which, which is often uh, underappreciated. Health diplomacy, we already have a lot in terms of uh, medical treatment, but you do not have often the same level uh, going on when it comes to like epidemics and public health uh, issues. So you have Indian visas are granted somewhat limited but fairly fast for Pakistani patients to go to India for cardiovascular surgery, for certain kinds of ailments like that. But when it comes to regional cooperation around epidemiology of diseases such as dengue, as I was saying, very limited, which is where the regional cooperation bit is more likely. Because if you just have, you know, individuals going for treatment, that becomes a very um, sort of specific philanthropic gesture. It doesn't give you the full regional context which you need to be able to move that way forward as we're trying to say in this report. Finally, universities, which are clearly very near and dear to me, I find it really regrettable that it is much more difficult for academics to get visas for India and Pakistan than it is for music or dance troops or uh, cultural activities. We have tried to organize conferences about five years ago, the National Science Foundation, we tried to hold a joint research effort on glaciology to get Indian and Pakistani glaciologists to cooperate with each other. Um, it was impossible to get visas either way. So it is for scientists, regrettably, both countries have made it more difficult to cooperate. Whereas science, you know, if you think about the larger vision of science for peace and Linus Pauling and the Peace Prize and all, science should be an objective effort to promote peace building. But it is again framed, unfortunately, in the context that the scientists will somehow steal our secrets. And this is where you know, perhaps some of the work with the Plowshares Fund that New America is doing, potentially other things, may be of interest because the, the whole understanding of science as objective rather than as being somehow very strategic and manipulative is one where within the environmental context can be changed. Because environmentally, you do not have to deal with the same kind of thing like a nuclear scientist. I mean, you're talking about something which can be uh, synergistic, which can really help both countries or the region in cooperating. But it, 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 it can be done perhaps through the South Asian University. This is one achievement of SARC, which I should note. It will be starting uh, middle of next year to have formal classes and so on. There are two programs right now in economics and in computer science. This was started as an effort by SARC. It's largely funded by the Indian government, but it's, it's kind of like a track to effort, but with a bigger footprint. Uh, India has committed that not more than 50% of the students will be Indian. So they have to have 50% of students from the SARC region. So they'll have to give them visas for that because it's in New Delhi. The university is physically in New Delhi. Um, and that's fine, it's good, because you know India is the largest country in the region, and it's, it's fine that it has a certain level of uh, prestige and uh, influence. Um, so how do we leverage this very important initiative like the South Asian uh, University to raise these issues to that higher level? An important effort and one worth watching in the next couple of years, especially as it starts off. So key policy prescriptions, just to summarize, we've got. These were the sort of the, the six key policy prescriptions out of the report. First of all, salience of SARC, Let's get beyond the cynicism of the past inefficacy. You know, there is much potential in this organization if we can empower it, reconfigure its mandate appropriately without being a strategic threat. And so that, that needs to be further looked into. Uh, and I'm hoping that also there is more donor interest in that kind of an effort because it does need that impetus often to really get off the ground. 
beyond the Indus Waters Treaty, and here I agree with some of the work with the, which the Wilson Center has done, uh, like uh, Michael Kugelman has written about uh, not trying to necessarily renegotiate the Indus Waters Treaty, because the Indus Waters Treaty was a distributive agreement. Rather, let's think about keep the Indus Waters Treaty, keep the dispute resolution mechanism, it's working, let it work. But let's think about integrative approaches to planning. Let's think about ways by which we can actually look at water conservation and efficiency strategies and so on, which are likely to increase cooperation and also make water more av available so that distributive conflicts are less likely to occur, right? And we know for a fact how much wastage there is in the system, and that's not just an issue for South Asia. It's the same problem across much of the world. So let's think about integrative planning cooperation and use that as a means of moving forward. Third recommendation policy prescription is mountains do matter, and we should not feel shy from that, you know. It's going, Aldo Leopold's famous essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, it's not just a romanticized version of why mountains are important. It's because mountains define boundaries, ecological boundaries, and hence sometimes political boundaries. They're contested terrain. They're ecologically very important as sources of water, um, uh, as uh, communities which have very unique cultural identities. Uh, that is why you have oftentimes many distinct cultures between valleys. The reason why Papua New Guinea has the highest number of languages of any country in the world is because of its mountainous terrain and how isolation leads to that. So there are many reasons why mountains are significant. And empowering an organization like Isimo is important and is, a, is one of the recommendations made as well, especially with reference to those seven transboundary areas that they have. Invoking environmental treaties. Let's not be shy about it. Let's get the treaties which the countries have been already agreed to. There is a legal mandate. We can actually invoke those legal mandates move forward and see what is, so in, at any time there is a convention of the, uh, the conference of the parties, there can be a transboundary program of work is prioritized and given more emphasis, and countries are asked to display what have they done in that regard. Existing knowledge networks, academics collaborating, facilitation, this is related to the recommendation around, I would say as India and Pakistan are negotiating this new visa policy, uh, they need to focus on knowledge networks as one of the key factors in their visa policy to facilitate that. I, for example, as an American citizen, but born in America, but because I have a Pakistani lineage, for me to get a, an Indian visa, minimum time usually is going to be three months. It's still very difficult. Same is true on the other side. This has to change for academics especially. It's again easier for the cultural exchange efforts, but it's more difficult. And there are ways in which this can be done very effectively. We have excellent models for visa management, which we can look at, which would still make sure that the security concerns are there, but you can still have access. This, this is done time and again. You have even countries where I mean, China has an amazing system of hybridity when it comes to visa access in different territories and where you go and so on. There are many lessons which can be learned from there. There are lessons actually which can be learned from Israel in terms of how they keep their security concerns, but they do not constrain people from traveling. So as, a, as an American citizen, it is easier for me as a Muslim American to go to Israel than it is for me to go to India. I still do not, there's no separate process for a Pakistani American to go to Israel. Yes, they'll interview me for 45 minutes at the airport, but that's okay, I don't mind that. I'd rather have that than to wait three months and then still be denied an Indian visa. Or the same for my Indian friends coming to Pakistan. It's not to just blame India, it's the same as it's a reciprocal problem. So there are ways to do it, and there are lots of creative models which we should look into. And then finally, crisis communication, climate and food key issues which we need to prioritize in terms of how communication occurs, right? And there is tremendous opportunity here because donors are prioritizing that. Hundred billion dollars set aside for climate change, right? In terms of adaptation and mitigation strategies. That is a hell of a lot of money for any kind of environmental issues, and yet there has not been much prioritized around cooperation where you could actually get peace dividends. Food security, same way. So those are the key sort of policy prescriptions. And I'll end there with this map, just to give you a map 
without political boundaries to give you a sense. It was really hard to find a map on Google Images which didn't have political boundaries. Um, but this just gives you a sense of some of my recommendations which I'm giving and why. You know, look at the, the salience of the mountains. It's just the ecoregion itself, the floodplains, the topography, and how it is defined. I mean, this is, of course, the, uh, the Balochistan region, Waziristan in that area that Peter is very familiar with. Um, and how that really makes us then think in terms of ecological cooperation. So thank you, and I look forward to discussion. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really uh, thorough and really interesting presentation. And before I open it up to the audience, I wanted to ask you uh, just some, some more general questions. You know, it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, there's less sort of, in a sense, um, climate change denialism in, in South Asia, in Pakistan, and in India than there is perhaps in the United States. I mean, I think the 2010 floods, I recall President Zadari, for instance, talking about am I right, talking about climate change afterwards and saying we need to, so it seems that there is a sort of opportunity uh, that exists in South Asia because, you know, people are really seeing the evidence. Uh, is that true? I mean, is that, is there, is it less of a, I mean, in this country it seems to be something, I mean, certainly the Obama administration has sort of taken a punt on the whole mm -hmm. issue. Do you think there's more opportunity uh, in South Asia? Yes, uh, regarding climate change, um, if you go out into the villages and you talk to um, the community members there, there is tremendous acceptance that the climate has changed. So if you talk to the NGOs like LEAD, LEAD Pakistan, I'm on the board of governors of that one, so I know particularly the work they have done, they, they get very positive sort of reception from, on climate change from the communities. But within the security establishment, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a sense of, well, you know, we don't want to deal with this. This is, you know, it's a very small issue and we can work around it. Um, and uh, now the floods of 2010 did change that to some degree. There was a, a, a realization that this is more than just an aberration. Um, but um, what we are seeing is now that the donor interest is driving it. So there is a lot of donor interest to give money around climate change adaptation because Pakistan has been especially considered the most uh, vulnerable country in terms of climate change uh, regionally and uh, overall. Uh, Bangladesh is particularly vulnerable because of sea level rise, but they have already got a lot of cultural uh, adaptations around it. So Pakistan does not have as many. So I think that is changing. But it's still uh, an area which deserves attention, uh, particularly when it comes to um, issues of connecting food and water to climate change. Because we still do not have those connections made. So the, most of the connections which are made with um, climate change are around flooding. Mm -hmm. But it's not as much around, well, what will happen in terms of desertification in some areas and whether you'll be able to grow enough food to feed your pe people and so on. And so that's the area where connections need to be made more. Given, you know, three years ago, if we had had this conversation, it would have seemed improbable that Pakistan was going to grant India most favored nation mm. uh, uh, MFN on, on trade. And clearly there's been a, I mean, an exponential uh, kind of uh, move between, you know, particularly on the Pakistani side to sort of normalize the trade process. There's a long way to go. And in fact, we're publishing two papers later this week on, on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, by Mohsin Khan and Nisha Taneja, um, one Indian economist, one Pakistani economist. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what is, as a model for, well, I guess two questions. One is, what concrete uh, project would make sense for India and Pakistan, for instance, to cooperate on? And um, is there other lessons from this rapprochement on trade Obviously, that was driven by the business community and, mm -hmm. and must have also got the green light from the military and the Pakistani side. Are there lessons to be learned from what happened on the trade side? Yes, yep. I think there are some specific areas like the conventions I mentioned, which um, the Europeans have. If we were to use a similar convention on transboundary pollution for South Asia, you have uh, like the Ravi River, which flows from India into Pakistan and flows along um, Lahore, most, uh, you know, it's very important for Lahore. Uh, it was one of the rivers that is largely assigned to um, India for uh, water usage. 
according to the Indus Waters Treaty. But um, the Ravi's pollution problem, not the quantity but the quality, is having a huge health impact on the Pakistani side. Uh, and this could be a very small tangible area where India mm -hmm. and Pakistan could have cooperation mm -hmm. uh, around transboundary pollution issues. Uh, you could have, um, with regard to Sir Creek, as I mentioned, a very tangible Ramsar transboundary wetland site initiative, uh, which could be first developed on the Indian side to have a Ramsar site and then make that part of a transboundary effort. Um, where you have a, um, the Sir Creek dispute is resolved partly through that initiative. Uh, so uh, I think there are some of these very specific areas where we could have cooperation that could be just as tangible as some of the trade efforts. Um, mm -hmm. But it comes down to a matter of leadership, really. Sure. Because anytime you know you can have dismissive approaches on a particular effort, uh, but uh, I, I remain hopeful that now we have the Pakistani election is coming up as well, and uh, on the Indian side too, uh, there may be some more well, momentum. That, that, you, that comes to the next question, which is, you know, essentially the resolution for the Sir Creek dispute, as far as I understand it, is sort of you've mentioned one. There is a potential resolution. It's not. It's relatively low hanging fruit, and Siachen, similarly. So, has the hold up on these. Uh, basic, I mean, has it been, obviously it's political, but has it been to do with the elections and people not wanting to make a decision while there's sort of a, a lame duck, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, you know, obviously the Pakistani election is going to be in, in the spring of next year. So would, that, would a new civilian government be more likely to take these issues up or, or not? Well, I'm, you know, it's, it, I think the problem is that there is this, a, a kind of a, um, a status quo syndrome where people say, you know, I've spoken to uh, Indian and Pakistani military officials on Siachen, for example, which is a low hanging fruit in one way. And I said, you're spending half a million dollars a day keeping troops there, all that. And there's a sense, well, we've done it f since 1986. Why do you think we can't continue to do that? Mm -hmm. So there, it, there is this, um, rather than saying, well, that money could be spent in this, this, this way. So my own feeling is without mediation of some kind and that mediation doesn't have to be very pronounced it can be sort of behind the scenes incentives like business incentives you know actually on the gujarat side the gujarat government even though it is very conservative on the indian side they are very pragmatic when it comes to business interests mm. so if it was packaged more in terms of well you know think about the ecotourism potential think about what kind of levels of development you could have if there was not this tension in that Indus Delta region. Perhaps that may help. So I think the connections haven't been made, the case hasn't been made in those very pragmatic terms. So people still think of these as somewhat romanticized visions or solutions, whereas they are very practical solutions. Give us a sense of um, the extent to which there is an environmental movement in both Pakistan and India that sort of talks to each other, and then what mm -hmm. forums, and what are they, have they achieved anything, or is it basically just talking at this point? There is a very vibrant movement on both sides. Um, there have been some specific efforts, uh, particularly Terry, the Energy and Research Institute, uh, which um, was uh, the founding director, Rajinder Pachauri, is also a very prominent um, international diplomat. He's the, been the head of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He has made an effort to come to Pakistan several times on an environmental sort of lesson drawing, comparing effort between India and Pakistan. Um, so Terry has made that effort through um, WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, both in India and Pakistan. So the international environmental NGOs, which have offices in both countries, they get to cooperate because they, they may have their you know, general meeting in Switzerland and they actually get to physically meet each other and think about. But because, because of this other problem of access, there's very little in terms of joint projects. There's lesson drawing across, but very little joint projects. And the law, um, LUMS, Lahore, yes. um, what is this? University kind of, of Management, Management of Sciences. I mean, they, they've, they've actually had sort of Indian yes. politicians and scientists come to discuss environmental issues in Lahore, right? Yes. So That's yeah, relatively I, new? That's right. I was involved in this process uh, last year with, with the help of the World Economic Forum. We tried to get Indian parliamentarians for the first time to give a public uh, 
uh, sort of discussion uh, uh, lecture uh, in uh, Lahore to students. They have of course visited many times, you've had parliamentarians come on visits both ways, but this was the first time that students were able to engage with them uh, and it was focused on climate change and environmental cooperation and they felt that this was a safe topic to, c to consider and so they did it in a public forum which was heartening and it was moderated by an Indian uh, TV host, Barkha Dutt, who is very prominent uh, in Lahore. So that was the first time we, we were able to do that. But again, the follow up is not possible because then you don't have the access for research opportunities. What I would have liked is after that they said, okay, Indian and Pakistani students, let's then now think about a joint project which involves a transboundary issue and let's try to get resources to work forward on it. That has not happened. That may happen maybe with the South Asian University or those kinds of efforts. Great. Let's throw it open to questions. If you have a question, just identify yourself and, and uh, wait for the microphone. The gentleman behind you. Good afternoon. Uh, David Meckel with the Stimson Center. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Salim. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask you to talk a little bit about um, how do we move track two initiatives up to the track one level, uh, particularly in the context with which you've talked about um, developing knowledge networks, uh, academic cooperation, discussions which by definition would be taking place outside of uh, formal diplomatic circles, but which may gather in uh, retired diplomats or uh, people with uh, governmental affiliations, but still not uh, track one efforts. But where the objective of integrating this information, whether it be scientific research or uh, best practices or uh, in the knowledge of indigenous peoples, et cetera, um, how do we move that information, those recommendations, uh, up to the track one level? Yes, thank you, David. For the, you know, I, a lot of it is dependent on the specific track one diplomats being willing to engage on this. So one example I'll mention is uh, Myanmar and Burma. Asia society had a long-standing track two process going on between the US and Burma, Myanmar, um, for several years. And uh, when there was an effort made on the track one level as well, there was leadership to engage, that there was a very good interface between the two. And you could see that that track two process was then harnessed by a track one. So because track two is, is just simply not empowered to do more, the initiative has to come from track one to say, okay, yes, let's capitalize on it and make that connection. In the case of Burma, Myanmar, it happened. Same Asia Society group have worked, Suzanne DiMaggio has done admirable work also on the Iran side of track two. But that has not been harnessed because the same State Department initiative was not on the, there on that side. So. Yeah. But I guess if the track two doesn't exist, there's nothing to, when you finally decide yeah. to do something, there's nothing to draw on. So the That's track, right. even if it's not going anywhere, it's still worth, exactly. I mean, it, eventually somebody hopefully will hopefully, realize. Yeah, exactly. Let, so let me, the repertoire is there. So. Let me ask you um, on the visas, because I, my understanding is, is that part of the MFN trade negotiations are to make it easier for Indian and Pakistani businessmen to, mm. the visa regime is going to change. Why wouldn't the why wouldn't scientists be part of that or or, or people te people with technical backgrounds because yeah. obviously business is somewhat reliant on yeah. uh, technical you know technical adv advice and, and 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 maybe also you know particularly in the IT s yeah. space I mean it the people in the IT on both sides of the border don't care about Kashmir very much they care about yeah. Yeah. So that seems like a sort of fruitful area. I just wanted to see what you thought about it. Yes, I, I mean, I totally agree with you, but unfortunately that is not how the visa regime has been framed right now. It's very specific to particular kinds of business people. Uh, so it would be most likely CEOs and management people who will be g granted those fast visas. Um, and uh, so you, you could get, you know, the the industrialists being able to go very easily. Now it so happens that in some cases the industrialists also have environmental proclivities like the, the Tatas and the Indian side. You have uh, Sayyid Babur Ali on the Pakistani side who's an in industrialist but he's also the you know founding director of WWF Pakistan. So you may get some hopefully overlap but you will the scientists bit you know to get an academic university professor coming and going the same way unfortunately there is still this 
sense of suspicion that somehow they are going to you know steal the secrets to develop and especially IT because tech, mm. you know computers they think are particularly vulnerable for you know hacking and so on and so forth so they, they, that has become an even more of a signed, uh, you know kind of a, a security concern um, and I think it's fine to vet them and do ha have a process but there should be a track so I hope that the, you know, one of the uh, sort of, if there can be any impact of a report like this and your other efforts should be that both governments consider that and they should be encouraged and given assurance by, by experiences from places like China or Israel or whoever ever that it's possible to do it without compromising security. Great. Any other questions? Uh, the lady here. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, Iqbal with uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Urban and Regional Planning. Salam alaikum, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, you talked about Beyond the Indus Waters uh, Treaty, and you talked a little bit about integrative planning. Could you please elaborate on that? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, tell me a little bit so more. And, and actually, and just yeah. tell us what the Indus Water Treaty basically does so that everybody yeah, understands yeah, the, sure. the discussion. And, so and 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 is it's was negotiated in sixty two, right? Yes, yes. So and what I mean, how if it was going to be updated, how might it look? So the the Indus Waters Treaty came about part as a reactive uh, solution to an ongoing dispute which was going on around water sharing in India and Pakistan. So the solution initially the initiative came from David Lilienthal who was the head of the Tennessee Valley Authority in the US. So this is also important to note that the US played a very interesting mediating role in this even though now the US is a kind of hands off on many of these mediation efforts but the Tennessee Valley Authority provided a lot of the kind of technical background around it but Lilienthal's original view was that let's think about the whole river basin and consider mechanisms by which water can be most efficiently and optimally used and energy generated. But the World Bank's view was, the World Bank was to provide funding for those, this project. So Lilienthal was kind of advising the bank. World Bank's view was, you know, let's try to take the path of least resistance to solve this problem. Path of least resistance was distributive, meaning dividing up. So you've got six rivers, you give three to India, three to Pakistan, and you build infrastructure which will be able to store water during times of hyd you know, hydrological variation. So World Bank said, okay, we will build two dams on the Pakistani side, Tarbela and Mangla, uh, with other donor assistance as well, like Mangla Dam on Jhelum, the US gave a, a considerable amount of money for it too. And so three rivers to India, three rivers to Pakistan, dams constructed, problem solved and then we have a dispute resolution mechanism. If there is a dispute, World Bank will hire an engineer who will come in and arbitrate the dispute. That was the solution. It was not what Lilienthal had originally wanted was to see, well, where does it make sense to have water conservation? Where does it make sense to grow these kinds of crops here, there, have trade? No, there was no. So integrative planning means you're not just dividing it up but you are thinking about how is water used, so agriculture in those contexts, rather than what the treaty did was basically divide up the rivers. So it solved the problem, but it was a proximate solution, not an ultimate solution. But you're saying it shouldn't be rene renegotiated, or you are, what, are you, what are you saying? What I'm saying is that we should let that mechanism exist because that's you know, worked when if you've got like a dam was being constructed by India, if Pakistan complains, you get an engineer, there's arbitrate and this all. But if you want to actually improve the resource availability, don't try to renegotiate it, but rather say, okay, India, Pakistan, let's have a, a, a separate regional uh, agreement on water efficiency, on cooperating over technologies around water usage, um, on figuring out what kind of crops to grow and trade those crops because those crops are the ones which are using 70% of the water. Yeah. So if it makes more sense that India is able to grow tomatoes with less water used and less inefficiency, grow the tomatoes in India, trade them with Pakistan, give Pakistan assurance that tomatoes are okay to trade. You know? And that will solve the water problem in an integrative way rather than saying, well, Pakistan, you have promised this much water. We don't care what you do with it. If you're wasting it, that's okay because it's your water. You know, yeah. and then down the road, there's scarcity 
still in the country. Well, that seems like a very sensible idea. Is there anybody who's doing anything about it? And well, there there is some movement now to um, consider that this um, you know this notion of virtual water, which is the, uh, comes from the Middle East, that water is actually um, imported and uh, exported through commodities uh, should be applied to South Asia. The Punjab government in Pakistan has considered that prospect, and Punjab is sort of the breadbasket of Pakistan. Uh, but it requires, I think, still much more at the international level between the two countries. Well, so what, what sort of crops are very water intensive and what sort of and don't make sense, as it were? Yeah. Uh, well, and, rice, and, rice is one, particularly, yeah. and rice is very much a uh, staple. Um, so that sounds like it would be difficult. But is, is there an example of a mm -hmm. kind of crop that is water intensive but not that useful in the wider? I mean, rice is not going to be yeah, yeah. abolished from the South Asian no, diet. No, not to, not to abolish it, but to l let it be grown and traded where it makes more sense to grow it and trade it. Uh -huh. And that may require it to be also more uh, regional. You know, it could involve China. It could involve other countries where it is. There, you know, you have or Southeast Asian countries as well. So, but... Then there are other crops which can be certainly uh, less water intensive. There are cash crops also which we can consider, like cotton is important clearly for the textile sector. Um, uh, you know, you could have um, uh, the, the um, wheat clearly is another one which uh, has been growing in prominence. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying they need to change the diet or anything. Right. It's, but <clears throat> it's just looking at where is it that you're going. Like, for example, I mean, in Sindh, parts of Sindh, um, you, you have a very dry climate, but there has been irrigation allowing them to grow crops there. A lot of the water is basically lost in evaporation during that period. So it may not make sense to be you know, growing crops in those parts of Sindh. It may make sense to be growing those uh, crops in parts of Uttar Pradesh in India and being able to actually import them. Mm -hmm. There's a vast range of them where it may be. <coughs> Any other questions? Chairman here. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin. I'm wondering if external f funding, let's say from in, in the area of health, from an organization like the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. or the National Academy of Sciences from the U.S., might be ap applicable in certain areas that to try to set a spark for interregional type of, a, of, of cooperation that is not uh, being available right now? I think so, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the Gates Foundation uh, has a particular interest in health. And uh, I think that um, this um, you know, dengue uh, situation, as well as the polio situation in Pakistan, uh, has potential for Gates engagement. Um, now that ties into like the polio issue is very much tied to education. We cannot uh, extricate the two because of the same, you know, I mentioned the conspiratorial rhetoric and so on. And so some of the, the efforts which I have done externally is around environmental education in like Islamic schools and other schools also across the region to make sure people do not have a conspiratorial view of healthcare, uh, which has sadly been the case with polio. Um, and so the, the Gates Foundation can potentially help. I think they would be considered more neutral than U.S. government funding, definitely. And um, you know, Gates in India is very well regarded, of course, and they've invested enormously in India. In Pakistan also, he's actually quite well regarded because of some of the efforts and overtures which he has done. Uh, uh, in um, There was a Pakistani young uh, student who was the, the youngest Microsoft employee. And she sadly died, uh, not because of any, um, you know, terrorist activity. She just had a you know, natural death. And he, uh, she, because of that, um, there was um, a lot of engagement from Bill Gates in Pakistan. And I was hoping at that point, this was just last year, that there would be some momentum uh, from Gates Foundation. Uh, it has not transpired yet, but I think that's a great idea. And if you have, I think, um, access there, <laughs> you should certainly support that yeah well, it's interesting this you this epidemiology issue because it again this is sort of like trade it's it's very kind of concrete it affects both countries uh, rather directly and yet there's almost no um, kind of discussion between Indian 
uh, epidemiologists and Pakistani epidemiologists? Yes. Very limited. Yes, it's unfortunate. Uh, I mean, there is the World Health Organization has, uh, you know, staff in both uh, countries. But uh, apart from that, the, the collaboration between uh, governmental agencies on public health has been um, very limited. If anything, there's more of this kind of fortress mentality of, okay, well, if there's an epidemic here, don't let people in and all, but rather than saying, uh, let's try to cooperate. Um, and uh, in Lahore, when this dengue epidemic happened, uh, Shabash Sharif, the chief minister of uh, Punjab, uh, said that, you know, this is an area he would like to support. So um, maybe uh, th this year we've had less of a dengue problem this past year. But, uh, let's see. Because Lahore is so close to India, yeah. in a sense, a lot of the sort of impetus for some yeah. of these shared seems to be coming out of Lahore, right? whether it's yes. the trade or, or whether it's the environmentalists or... Uh, That's right, yeah. It's the second largest city in Pakistan. Uh, it's right on the border. Uh, there's um, much potential. I mean, there is a already uh, regular bus service. Um, there's a train service to India. So Lahore can be, you know, a focal point um, for more Indo-Pak efforts. And uh, so I think, and also the, the uh, provincial government is being more responsive than in the past. So I'm Hopeful, let's see what happens now with the, with the next election. Any other questions? This gentleman here. Hello, I'm Sarad. I'm from Nepal. I have been your student. Uh, oh, yes, uh, my question is, you talked about uh, um, environment has been in low politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I speak from experience of Nepal, that uh, uh, environment, uh, environment policy making has been always top down. And when we talk about environmental conservation, we hardly talk about people's life and livelihoods mm -hmm. in policy making level. Therefore, uh, how can we connect uh, that discussion about this uh, ecological cooperation uh, with people's life and livelihood mm -hmm. and so that it generates uh, discussion debates at the public level? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, so job creation, which is the main aspect of livelihoods often because you know, most of the people in South Asia are now connected to a market economy. And uh, so subsistence lifestyles are very rare. I mean, you have in some in the mountainous areas actually have subsistence, but most of it is still connected to a market economy. Um, there is potential for job creation uh, around environmental issues. First of all, I mean, peace would create more job opportunities, I think, overall, because you would get, you know, economic growth would allow for that to happen. And especially in Pakistan, economic growth has been stifled because of insecurity. So I would say that if you had environmental cooperation with peace dividends, you would get more livelihood creation as a result. But even beyond that, um, if you focus on certain kinds of industries where there is um, what we may call comparative advantage for these countries, uh, you could generate a lot of livelihood. So for example, with regard to uh, renewable energy sector, there is potential to create a lot of jobs and livelihoods and cooperation between India and Pakistan. You've got you know, good IT sector, you have you know, cheaper labor in Pakistan. I mean, this is the, the argument for um, greater trade also, which Pakistanis fear that you know, India will become more dominant, but the reality is because labor is cheaper in Pakistan when the currency is far more devalued, it's more likely that you will actually get Indians investing in Pakistan and setting up factories and so on to encourage. I mean, we've seen that actually, interestingly enough, with Pakistanis investing in Bangladesh. Um, the textile sector in Bangladesh, large parts of it is controlled by Pakistanis who invested in Bangladesh because the labor was cheaper and there was more energy access. So, so um, you see th 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 there will be job creation opportunities around. And I think green technologies especially has tremendous potential in that arena uh, for manufacturing. Uh, Pakistan has, you know, very sound textile sector. You've probably seen the HSBC ads in airports which say Pakistan is the world's second largest uh, exporter of textiles. Uh, so, you know, there, there is tremendous potential in those areas to create jobs, but do it in an ecologically efficient way. So, I think that, I mean, if you do, like, energy conservation, if you can improve the energy profile in Pakistan through better 
greener approaches to energy, you will lift the whole industrial sector. Right now, the biggest crisis in Pakistan from an economic perspective is the shortage of energy, whether it is uh, gas or hydroelectric and so on. And so if you are able to improve the efficiency through environmental cooperation, you would raise that. My, my understanding, Salim, is that the uh, Pakistan generates enough en energy to, to satisfy all its needs, but it, it's, 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 it's been lost somewhere along the way. Is that because people are uh, stealing it or is it because of inefficiencies or what, what is that? Um, well, there, there are different perspectives on the supply demand situation. I would say, I mean, Pakistan, with, with its current forecast for population growth and development, does not have, I think, enough energy for, and it depends what kind of energy too. Like, for example, for heating, you know, you don't want to use electricity for heating. You would want to use natural gas for heating, and natural gas is a huge shortage. So, I mean, if you go to Pakistan right now in Islamabad, Lahore, you know, the, the biggest complaint is people are just don't have, even the most affluent homes, they cannot get gas. I mean, they have to mm. buy a cylinders of gas. So, I mean, there is the clear energy shortage there because you want to use the right kind of energy for the right thing. Now, if you talk about does Pakistan have enough energy for the industrial sector from like hydropower and all, probably yes, there is a lot of inefficiency in the system. Mm. But... You know, the whole, like, but you've got the problem is you've got some industries which are linked to gas. They built the whole infrastructure around gas. Now you don't have gas, so then what do you do? Then you have to. Well, you get uh, a pipeline <laughs> from Iran, right? Yes, well, that's why I'm a supporter of the two pipelines, too, because I think in the long run, Pakistan and India will have such a high demand for natural gas. Uh, um, because, you know, the, the other forms of electricity have potential, like certainly hydroelectric, but you need a mobile energy source as well. So gas is the most versatile that way because you can use it for cars, for CNG and cars. You can use it for electricity generation. You can use it for direct heating. So you don't, so it has a carbon footprint. Yes, it's much lower than coal and oil, but it has much more versatility. And so, and the, the pipeline infrastructure in Pakistan, especially for gas is very good. So if you could actually get the supply you could have most of the cities immediately have access to gas. Uh, you have, after Argentina, Pakistan, until recently because of this crisis, had the highest CNG prevalence of any country in the world, which was a compressed natural gas in cars. Mm. You had 60, 70% of all the cars using gas. You know, cylinders in the back of the car, and you had reduced pollution and so on. But now because the supply constraint is there, you don't have, so I think the pipeline, as well as LNG, the liquefied natural gas terminals, both are important. Any other questions? Both. Well, be because we don't have, uh, we've run out of our indigenous gas generation capacity to a large degree. There's also been a lot of terrorist activity around gas infrastructure. In Balochistan. And especially in Balochistan, uh, which has been a problem. But overall, the supply is much less, too. So a lot of the, the Sui uh, region gas has been depleted. There isn't that much left. So you know, Pakistan then has to get either gas through tankers, through liquefied natural gas, or through pipeline. And the demand is going to be so much that you'll probably need both. So. Um, the, the pipelines make a lot of sense for that reason that uh, they will provide, I think also they could have peace dividends. I mean, if you frame them properly and you provide enough security and so on, both of them. And just uh, so we're, we're clear that the, one of them would come from Iran through Pakistan to India, yeah. uh, which the United States is blocking, yeah. or would like to block. But, yeah. the, but Pakistan is basically saying, you don't really have a vote in this issue, mm. right? I mean, this, this pipeline will be built. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, on the Iranian side, it's been built, and the Pakistani side, they're trying to figure out the funding. And I, I have argued in some you know, earlier work I did for Brookings around pipelines that uh, the U.S. government has actually uh, given a waiver to Turkey. Turkey imports gas from Iran, uh, and you know there are no sanctions on Turkey for importing it. So it is very much within the U.S. Uh, government's um, ability to waive um, Pakistan's importing of gas from Iran. So this is clearly an opportunity, I think, for double peace building, both with Iran and with Pakistan. 
um, and there is enough demand that it wouldn't undermine the TAPI project because initially there was that okay if we have this then the TAPI project which well, the is TAPI project is Turkmenistan through Afghanistan That's to right. Pakistan and then to India and then to India uh, but do you think this will ever be built I mean there's been a discussion of this for a long time but I mean Afghanistan is still uh, I, I mean I wouldn't yeah. invest in it personally well, I mean, you know, if there can be uh, more security provided along the pipeline, yeah. uh, it can be done. I mean, if you think about uh, the uh, argument often the naysayers say, well, that region is so volatile, they'll blow up the pipeline. But there are ways to provide security. It would raise the cost of the gas, but it can be done. One example is the, you know, the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline from Azerbaijan through Georgia to Turkey. It goes through the most volatile part of Turkey, the Kurdish separatist areas, many times there have been attempts at attacks, but they have a very sound security system. Uh, British Petroleum was the main you know, corporate investor in that. IFC the, uh, provided financing, and it's working. It's been working for 10 years now. Initially, it was a very controversial project, but it's done fine. I would have hoped they would have actually built it partly through Armenia, where you could get more peace dividends between Azerbaijan and Armenia. They didn't do that. They actually bypassed Armenia. <laughs> But it's okay. At least it's you know it's improved relations between Azerbaijan and Turkey and Georgia. So. Well, Salim, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation, and thank you, thank you for the paper. Thank you very much. For the